And I'd just like to start by thanking the organizing committee, particularly Tom Fair, who I just want to mention uh, has been so helpful to me so many times in my career that you know, I, I'm not the most comfortable public speaker, and I, I try to avoid it. But when Tom asks me to do something, uh, I'll do anything. So thank you, Tom. So this is going to be a little bit of a different talk. Uh, it's, it's not really a companion diagnostics talk, uh, although I think the intuitive application of our technology could be ultimately in companion diagnostics. I'm going to, but this is more of a technology development talk. So I'm going to talk about our PreSage SIVO platform. SIVO stands for Comparative in Vivo Oncology, and I hope the acronym becomes apparent uh, soon. Just before uh, I get to this slide, I just want to go over just a little bit about how I uh, came to PreSage. So I think, like many of you, I've been driven by a passion to improve the lives of cancer patients and fully embrace the vision of precision oncology, matching the right drug to the right patient. And early on in my career, and, and through my career, I've been fed a pretty heavy diet of signal transduction and genetics. Uh, and early, you know, I was a graduate student when the data came out of Drucker's lab showing the efficacy of what ultimately became Gleevec that uh, completely changed the lives of patients with CML. And at the time, it looked like you know, maybe uh, all we needed to do was understand signal transduction pathways that go awry in cancer, find drugs that inhibit those pathways, and we could truly uh, enter a new era of precision medicine. And some of our experiments, uh, particularly when we threw these drugs on cancer cells that bore the right mutations, worked. Uh, we were able to kill those cancer cells. But then when we tried to translate into the clinic, the results were spotty and in some cases disappointing. So one of my, uh, one of the hypotheses that as to why some of these targeted therapies did not work uh, came from essentially this slide, that the tumor microenvironment matters. The tumor microenvironment has many different interacting components. There are many different types of uh, cancer cells. It's typically, typically in uh, solid tumors, a very heterogeneous uh, mass. There is interaction between the cancer cells in an extracellular matrix. There are regions of hypoxia and vascularization, which can change the way tumor cells respond to drug. And of course, what everyone's excited about it now in this age of immune oncology, there's an interaction between T cells and cancer cells. And this reminded me of a series of books that I uh, just read. If you're a science fiction fan like I am, uh, you would enjoy this book called the, or the trilogy of books called The Three Body Problem, essentially about a fictional world that's surrounded by three suns. And because it's surrounded by three interacting bodies, they're never really able to predict whether the sun was going to rise whether there would be a long period of darkness where you'd go into an ice age, or whether two suns would rise and essentially scorch their planet. So they had no real way of predicting, even though they recruited the, the finest scientists on this world of Tri-Solaris, even their best algorithms could not predict this three-body problem. And that, you know, given that, and this is also based on a classic physics problem, that you know, three interacting bodies, it's very difficult to uh, predict their motion based on static readouts. And that reminded me about you know, maybe a problem that we face with equating genomics to precision medicine. Michelle, in her talk this morning, suggested that genomics does provide a answer, but an incomplete answer to precision medicine. And you know, several successes, of course, are shown up here with BCR able and what I mentioned before with the invention of Gleevec, EGF receptors. And of course, BRAF receptors, and as Ken just mentioned, MSI and PDL1 uh, inhibitors. But there are other examples that uh, are less uh, optimistic. The, the Shiva trial, in which 741 tumor samples were screened, only 40% of which uh, had alterations that could actually be matched to a targeted agent. And when they looked at pr progression free survival between matched and physician's choice drugs, there was really no difference in PFS. There also seems to be a logistics issue when the uh, NCI match interim report came out where 2,000 tumors were screened. Uh, only 39% of these had actionable genetic alterations. And when these were matched to 10 treatment arms thus far, only uh, a very small percent, 
4% enrolled in a genotype match trial. So there does still seem to be a logistics issue with larger scale trials for genomics-based precision medicine. So as Michelle suggested, there, can we go beyond genomics and uh, progress other alternatives to precision medicine? And one of the knocks that I get from my former colleagues at Rosetta is, oh, Rich, you've become the anti-genomics guy. That's not true. I'm still a big believer in genomics, and genomics is a, an important part of precision medicine. We shouldn't stop this approach. But it's up to people, you know, frankly, like, like me, and I believe this is why I've been put here, to come up with the next generation of potential companion diagnostics. And the approach that I've taken, I consider a functional precision medicine approach, meaning add drug to a system, see how it perturbs that system, and see what comes back. And so I believe that functional precision cancer medicine approaches are needed to complement genomics, not replace genomics. And so when I was thinking about the system, what I had in mind in concept is this classic test to determine responses to antibiotics, the classic Kirby-Bauer antibiotic resistance test, where you have different wafers impregnated with different antibiotics plated on a lawn of bacteria, and those that work clear the lawn of bacteria in a very spatially defined way, and those that do not have, show no response. So this is a way to look at multiple drugs simultaneously in a relevant system. Could we pull this off in a much more complex environment, and that is the uh, solid tumor environment? And so what my goal was to, was to create what I call a toxicity sparing so the patient isn't, uh, isn't exposed to systemic levels of drug that would induce uh, adverse side effects. And toxicity sparing, trackable way to test multiple anti-cancer agents simultaneously and directly in a patient's own tumor in the real microenvironment. And so what our technology starts with is this device uh, here. This device, uh, as you can see, has eight needles on the end. These eight needles can deliver up to, obviously, eight different drugs or drug combinations directly into a patient's tumor. The needles are actually end-loaded with drug prior to this injection. And one of the features here is that when the uh, physician who uh, performs the procedure depresses this lever, the needles retract leaving behind the drug or columns of drug. And a depiction of this is shown here. So uh, we insert the device into the tumor, depress the lever, the needles retract, leaving behind these columns. And as you'll note, in a, a second important part of this device are these, what we call these fluorescent tracking micros microspheres. So these microspheres denote the position of each drug site and allow us to know which drug was exposed to which area. So here you see the device being inserted into a sarcoma's mass, and in this case it was a canine patient with sarcoma. This is just after the injection under the skin of uh, this particular patient. You can see all eight positions denoted by the fluorescent tracking marker, and in some cases we clock the tumor by uh, using a different colored tracking marker at site number one versus the other ones. As I mentioned before, each of these uh, drug injections or microdose injections leave behind a column of drug, which we section uh, uh, crosswise to for our analysis. And most of our analysis done to date, 99.9%, uh, is done via histology. And I don't know if you guys need uh, the lights dim to see this, but over this blue dappy stained background, this is a thin section cut uh, crosswise to the injection column where you can see that the, at positions two and four, and to some extent six, we've induced a response. So tumor cell clearing and uh, apoptosis marked by an antibody against cleave caspase three. In the other positions, again denoted by the fluorescent tracking marker, uh, you do not see a response. So a functional test to see which drugs work and which drugs don't in the context of a solid tumor, which is very analogous to this classic Kirby-Bauer antibiotic resistance test. So I just went over uh, this top row. What I want to mention is that uh, the final component of the system is an automated uh, software package, which when the slides go through our slide scanner, detect each region of interest based on detection of the fluorescent tracking marker hones in on each of these uh, regions and uh, assesses 
various biomarkers, and we have now over 100 IHC biomarkers uh, developed to date that covering proliferation viability, cell metabolism, signal transduction pathway activity, immune infiltrate, and tumor microenvironment uh, phenotypes. The uh, software detects each and every cell around the injection column and uh, determines whether they responded or not to the drug. So the cells that uh, here responded to the drug are denoted in these green dots. The cells that did not, denoted in red. And sometimes the analysis of these cells that did not respond in terms of a viability uh, readout or a DNA damaging readout are the most interesting cells to analyze because these cells are the ones that can give us an idea of how the tumor is resisting that initial exposure to drug. And this gives us rational hypotheses on how we can cut off these potential paths to cancer cell survival. A lot of our work in the early days was performed in mice harboring uh, xenografted tumors. I think it was the appropriate way to start. Uh, we published much of this work in Science Translational Medicine a couple years ago, and I'm not going to go over that work, but the bottom line is that what this paper showed was that SIVO was predictive in that the localized responses induced in animals bearing xenografts matched the same response to the same drugs when those drugs were given via uh, tail vein injection or, or by oral gavage. The technology is scalable. We could look at lots of drugs simultaneously. Uh, and it was clinically feasible. And we co-published this paper with several authors from our collaborators at the time from Celgene. In what we moved on to and what we took advantage of prior to uh, receiving uh, approval to uh, move forward into the human clinic uh, was a really nice network of Seattle area uh, vet, vet oncology clinics. So we now have uh, eight different clinics and 10 different clinicians working with us uh, to assess our technology in canine patients with typically sarcomas uh, and lymphomas. So here is an example of uh, one of those patients. Again, this is just a, a gross section uh, of a tumor that was uh, uh, subjected to our procedure with SIVO. You can see all eight uh, fluorescent tracking marker sites. And at two of these sites, so this is now just a thin H&E stained section of this very tumor, you can see that uh, there were clear, just overt responses or areas of tumor cell clearing around uh, these injection sites. Both of these sites, I'll just tell you, contained doxorubicin, which has been part of mainstay therapy in the human sarcoma clinic now for over four decades. The other drugs which we introduced were also typical uh, drugs used in the soft tissue sarcoma clinic, consistent with a lack of single agent efficacy in the STS clinic, gemcitabine in our hands rarely induced an effect. Docetaxel, unlike doxorubicin, didn't really induce uh, overt cell clearing, but did induce an expected phenotype given its impact on microtubules. You could see the cells rounding up with very abnormal mitotic spindles. And we published this work uh, earlier this year in Cancer Research. One of the important things that we learned from our work in canine patients, which each came with their own functioning immune system, was that certain drugs, such as doxorubicin, did induce in certain patients an immune response. And this is not super surprising, given that doxorubicin is probably the best characterized inducer of a phenomenon called immunogenic cell death. So around 40% of the patients, and in this study that we published, it was uh, about 17 K9 patients, we saw this accumulation of CD3 positive cells around the uh, drug-induced uh, kill zone. In the, do in the canine setting, we were limited to, to some extent by our IHC antibodies, so we, we didn't have antibodies against CD4 and CD8 populations, or at least not ones that worked in our hands in the canine patients, but we do believe these are active T lymphocytes, given that when we stain with uh, CD3 for T cells and granzyme B, the payload of these T cells, we can actually see in some cases the uh, polarization of this granzyme B and expulsion into adjacent cancer cells. So to date, uh, SIVO has been evaluated in uh, literally thousands of mice, uh, 81 canine patients with cancer, and now six human subjects, four lymphoma patients from our first study uh, that was part of uh, this publication. And now, actually, this is out of date as of today. Uh, we actually we did a patient yesterday, so we now have uh, added 
uh, three patients to our uh, sarcoma study. And this is um, the picture from that study yesterday. Can you see that in the back? Okay, I'll show it to you later. So, uh, I, so our technology is covered just by, um, by eight important patents, uh, and we now have six peer-reviewed publications covering the work. I do believe that there is potential for CDX development in the future. I think we have a long way to go, and at the moment, uh, this does not uh, fit our business model for the company. Uh, I, you know, frankly, we, we just are under-resourced. We would need a big influx of uh, you know, financial power from a bigger partner uh, to really pr pursue this in the right way for CDX development. But I do believe intuitively that this would be a phenomenal future application uh, of, of our approach. We're currently focusing on phase zero assessment of early stage uh, investigational uh, drugs under exploratory IND guidelines. And we're uh, in the midst of talking with the FDA and seeking de novo FDA approval to broaden access to our technology. Right now, our current soft tissue sarcoma study is being done on a, under a non-significant risk assessment, which was initially provided by the Fred Hutchinson IRB. For this study, they were unsure as to whether they could, were comfortable in giving that, so they, they uh, did, uh, we did communicate with the FDA, uh, and they gave it the NS, NSR uh, approval. The reason I think that the, the, there is quite an opportunity here for these phase zero studies is that you can uh, gain biological insights uh, and early human data to inform go, no-go decisions in the drug discovery process. And, you know, I'm really basing uh, this assessment on uh, my experience uh, as an as early stage project team leader uh, at Rosetta, where I would have loved to have had the ability to test our early stage assets in, the, you know, in what we call the, the context that matters, although I, I think that dogs matter too, but in human patients to show that our proof of concept that when we expose those tumor cells to drug in their native microenvironment, it actually works. So I, I think that there, you know, this is where we're getting the most attention. So if you're developing a, a molecule that will turn cold tumors hot, will you see macrophage polarization? Will you see accumulation of cytotoxic T lymphocytes around the area where your drug was infused, or, or will you not? I think that's an important decision-making tool. So it, uh, our goal is really to enable assessment of these pre-IND uh, drugs uh, in what we call these tox-bearing efficacy or phase zero uh, setting. And we believe, you know, based on our estimates, that we w can uh, see these types of results at least 12 months earlier uh, than a typical IND package for a phase one study. And we're working towards uh, initiating our first phase zero clinical study with a pre-IND candidate uh, in the fall of next year. At this point, I, I want to go over uh, just some of the first data that came out of our human sarcoma study. And I say only have five minutes, so I'm going to hurry up. It's, an, it's a feasibility study, a 12-patient study, and the primary objective is really just to see whether the technology works in the setting of human tumors. We certainly know that it works in canine tumors, so technically it should. Secondary objectives were really to assess patient discomfort uh, and the variability of the local responses. And the exploratory objective, which I frankly and personally think is the most important one, is to get an idea of do the localized responses to SIVO correlate in any way with patient outcome. The, the, you know, the study is obviously underpowered to do that, but we should get a feel for it here. One of the things that uh, I didn't appreciate uh, in entering into the clinical study was all the logistics involved and the training that would be involved for the different sites. We started, at the, uh, as I said, at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. The device, none of these folks are pre-stage employees. The device is loaded by uh, the pharmacy, and they pass it off to an oncologist. This is our collaborator, Seth, who was very happy to get his first loaded device. The, uh, the handoff went very well, and it, it met our specs for uh, the timing uh, of that tr interaction. Here's uh, the post-injection data, or the image uh, from the first patient. It was an inguinal sarcomas mass uh, on the leg of the patient. And you could see uh, the fluorescent tracking marker under the skin. 
72 hours later, the surgeons removed it. No adverse effects or inflammation of the site have been reported in the first three patients. This is what the data looks like. And again, it, uh, we might have to dim the lights, but similar to what we saw in our canine uh, study, gemcitabine didn't induce any effect. Docetaxel in this tumor didn't induce any effect, but we did see a nice localized response around doxorubicin, consistent with doxorubicin's mechanism of action. You could see DNA damage by phosphogamma H2AX. You could see apoptosis by cleaf caspase 3 and some infiltrating macrophage, macrophage population coming in to probably clean up the mess. Unlike the canine, some, some of the canine patients, we did not see T cell infiltration around this region. We looked to assess you know, some of the reasons why. Uh, we know that phosphostat 3 activation does induce a uh, immunosuppressive microenvironment, and indeed, around the site of doxorubicin, we could see a nice uh, region of phosphostat 3 uh, staining. We also noted that uh, right in the middle of the uh, doxorubicin injection site, and if you have good eyes, you can probably see that there's, uh, that's okay, the, the fluorescent tracking marker here, here, and here. So this really is the epicenter. We see a lot of dying cells, but we also see a lot of live cells. And so even though doxorubicin has been mainstay therapy, the, the response rate and the curative rate is actually pretty low. So what are the mechanisms of, uh, that allow these cancer cells to survive even under uh, conditions where they're directly exposed to drug? And so we looked at this with various markers for pro-survival uh, uh, proteins like BCL2 and MCL1. We looked at upregulation of oncogenic pathways like the RASMAP kinase pathway and the mTOR pathway. And I left these blank because I typically like to play a guessing game with the crowd. But given the time, I'll just say that uh, even when we looked at BCL2 and the mTOR pathway, we didn't see too much happening. MCL1, we actually see a down regulation, which is, which is consistent with doxorubicin exposure. But we see this massive upregulation of phospho-ERK at the site, suggesting that it's possible that upregulation of the uh, RAS MAP kinase pathway, or frankly, the MAP, MAP kinase pathway, could be uh, one of the uh, pro-survival pathways uh, that allow these cells to withstand exposure to docs. This is very consistent with the approval of a drug called Lartruvo, which is an antibody that uh, inhibits the PDGF receptor. PDGF receptor, obviously, a receptor tyrosin kinase that leads to ERK phosphorylation. So we looked to see whether we could see upregulation of uh, activated PDGF as denoted by phosphorylated PDGF. And we do indeed see around the uh, site of doxorubicin injection uh, signs of elevated phosphor phosphorylated PDGF, which could lead to an amplification of ERK signaling. And uh, this was approved given what, because when given with doxorubicin, you actually see an almost one-year increase in overall survival. So ultimately, we would like to be able to correlate results like the one that you've just seen to uh, this type of analysis, but we're at the very early stages of doing so. I'm going to actually skip through this. This is just mouse data showing that, you know, at least in mice, we can correlate the localized responses to uh, overall survival, and we've done this many, many times. And just end with, oh, and we, you know, that doesn't really matter right now, uh, with these last few slides. So one, one message, SIVO is indeed poised to evaluate investigational agents in the clinic. We've worked out the technical aspects of it. We've worked out engineering and manufacturing. We're working out regulatory. We were invited to a CPI meeting a couple of years ago, and now we're in discussions with CDRH. And we have uh, now have a nice network of clinical research collaborators. The last thing I'd like to mention is that uh, Michelle Cleary and the Mark Foundation have given us a grant to generate the next version of SIVO, which uh, are, are based around sustained release micro inserts to look at longer mechanism of action drugs like your checkpoint inhibitors. We're aiming to put multiple drugs onto these micro inserts and barcode these by color so we can look at literally at dozens of different single agents and combinations and their responses in single tumors uh, and look at immune infiltrates surrounding uh, regions that have been exposed to the appropriate drugs. So I just want to end by uh, thanking uh, the Presage team uh, shown here. This is the entire team, the Mark Foundation, and our partners and investors, both Takeda and Celgene, have made investments in our company. Thank you very much. Thank you. Richard.